OCD, all about arranging your pens nice and neatly in colour order and washing your hands a few too many times, right? Hey everyone, welcome back to Bear It In Mind. In this video, we're looking at explanations for OCD. We've seen in a previous video how it's easy for people to have a misunderstanding of what OCD is and to know what the real characteristics are. In this video, we're less focused on what it's really like to suffer from OCD and more focused on explaining where OCD comes from. As we've said in previous videos, there are different explanations for mental disorders like OCD, depression and phobias, but on the A-level psychology course, the emphasis is just on one explanation for each condition. So for OCD, we're going to explore biological explanations. The biological explanation for OCD is broken down into two parts. Firstly, the role of genetics. This explanation states that a person is more likely to develop OCD if a family member has it because of the genetics they have passed on. This means that the DNA they have inherited may give them a predisposition to developing OCD or what could be called a vulnerability to OCD. Research into the role of genetics in OCD has focused on two specific genes. Firstly, there is the COMT gene. It's called the COMT gene because it is involved in the production of catechol O methyltransferase. But for you and me, let's just stick with the COMT gene. The COMT gene is thought to regulate the production of a neurotransmitter you may have heard of called dopamine. And the COMT gene appears to have changed or mutated in individuals with OCD so that it's not working as it normally would be in people suffering from OCD. Then secondly, there is the SIRT gene. The SIRT gene stands for serotonin transporter. And this SIRT gene appears to be changed or mutated in individuals with OCD. This change in the SIRT gene can lead to a decrease in the amount of another neurotransmitter you may have heard of called serotonin. Now, you might be wondering if there's any evidence for the role of these genes. Well, for the COMP gene, research by Tuchel et al. in 2013 compared 101 patients with OCD and 100 healthy control participants. They found that compared to the healthy control participants, the OCD patients had lower activity of the COMP gene than normal, and this was related to higher levels of dopamine. For the SIRT gene, Osaki et al. in 2003 found a mutation in the SIRT gene in two different families. Six of the seven family members with the mutated SIRT gene had OCD. Now, there is lots of further supporting evidence for OCD and the role of biology, but one of the key ways that psychologists can explore the role of genetics in human behaviour is through studying twins. There are two main types of twins, monozygotic twins, mono meaning one, zygotic meaning egg. These are identical twins who are from one fertilized egg and therefore share 100% DNA. Then there are dizygotic twins, di meaning two. These are non-identical twins who are from two separate fertilized eggs and therefore share 50% of their DNA. In other words, monozygotic twins are more genetically similar than dizygotic. Fred, you next. He's not Fred, I am. Honestly, woman, you call yourself our mother. In twin study research, concordance rates are compared. As a reminder, concordance rates are the degree of genetic similarity for a particular trait, and the trait that we're interested in is OCD. Supporting evidence for the role of genetics in OCD can be seen from twin study research by Nestat et al. in 2010. In their review of OCD and the role of genetics, they showed that of all the twin study research published to date, the concordance rates in monozygotic twins was higher than dizygotic twins. Now, just so we're clear on this, if OCD is genetic, we should find a higher concordance rate for monozygotic twins than for dizygotic twins. In other words, if one twin has OCD, the likelihood that the other twin develops OCD should be higher for monozygotics than for dizygotics. And that's exactly what Nestor et al. reported. Monozygotics had a 68% concordance rate for OCD if one twin had it, and dizygotics had a 31% concordance rate for OCD. However, whilst this research clearly shows the involvement of genetics in OCD, it also indicates that it is not just genetics that's involved. For example, if OCD was purely genetic, we would expect the concordance rates for monozygotics to be 100% because they're genetically identical. 
However, this is never the case. So this suggests that there must be something else involved in OCD, some other factor that is affecting the development of OCD. And many have pointed to the influence of environmental factors. More on that shortly. So the first biological explanation of OCD was genetics. In this second explanation, we're going to explore the neural explanation. The word neural relates to the nervous system. So we're going to consider this in two parts. Firstly, neurotransmitter levels. And secondly, an abnormal brain circuit. Some people have differing levels of a particular neurotransmitter. Neurotransmitter 1, dopamine. High levels of dopamine have been associated with people with OCD and particularly linked to compulsive behaviour. For example, Kim et al in 2007 gave OCD patients drugs that affected their dopamine levels and they found that this was correlated with less compulsion behaviours. These findings suggest that the dopamine neurotransmitter system could play an important role in OCD patients. Neurotransmitter 2, serotonin. Low levels of serotonin have been associated with anxiety and OCD. The idea here is that serotonin may be removed too quickly from the synapse before it has transmitted its signal. Now, for more information about the how and the why of serotonin with OCD, check out this next video on the biological treatments of OCD, where we take a deeper look at synaptic transmission. But for this video, it's enough to understand that lower levels of serotonin are associated with OCD. Okay, so how do we know this? What research points to the potential influence of serotonin in OCD? Sumro et al. in 2009 reviewed 17 studies into drug treatment for OCD. These 17 studies combined over 3,000 participants, and these studies compared drugs that affected serotonin levels in the brain with placebos. The results showed that these drugs that altered serotonin levels were more effective in reducing OCD symptoms. Basically, the OCD patients were given drugs that increased serotonin and these patients reported less OCD symptoms. Part 2. Abnormal Brain Circuits One area of the brain thought to be involved with OCD is called the orbitofrontal cortex. The orbitofrontal cortex is the area of the prefrontal cortex that sits just above the orbits also known as the eye sockets. The orbital frontal cortex is sometimes referred to as the worry circuit. This circuit involves the orbital frontal cortex, the basal ganglia, specifically a part of it called the caudate nucleus, the thalamus, and then back to the orbital frontal cortex. The orbital frontal cortex is involved in our perception of the world. And when we are worried, it sends the signal that we are worried to the thalamus. The thalamus is thought to be the centre of our perception of pain, among other things. This worry signal is normally suppressed or filtered by the caudate nucleus in the basal ganglia, but if there is something abnormal about the circuit at this point, then the thalamus becomes alerted to the signal quite strongly and confirms the worry back to the orbitofrontal cortex which is about logical thinking and making decisions, he's now going to start thinking, or we could say obsessing, about this worry. In other words, this worry circuit is overactive. And that then might lead to compulsive behaviours to cope with this anxiety and worry. Evidence for the role of this worry circuit, and specifically the orbitofrontal cortex in OCD, comes from Buick et al. in 2013. They looked at OCD patients who were on medication and OCD patients not on medication. They found that non-medicated OCD patients showed greater activity and connectivity in the orbitofrontal cortex. The level of activity in the orbitofrontal cortex was also positively correlated with how severe their OCD symptoms were. In other words, the more severe their OCD symptoms were, the more active was the orbitofrontal cortex. So now we've looked at two biological explanations, genetics with the Compton cert gene and neural explanations with the neurotransmitters dopamine and serotonin and then the abnormal brain circuit involving the orbitofrontal cortex. Now having outlined all of that, 
let's discuss this biological explanation for OCD in terms of its strengths and limitations. One practical application of the biological explanation of OCD relates to treatments. If one of the key factors involved in OCD is, for example, lower levels of serotonin because of the mutation of the search gene, then this knowledge can lead to drugs being prescribed to correct this imbalance. One particular form of drugs that have been used are called SSRIs, which stand for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors. SSRI medication has been successfully used to reduce OCD symptoms and therefore shows the value that the biological explanation has in helping to improve the lives of people suffering from OCD. For more information on SSRIs and how these drugs work, check out the next video on treatments of OCD. An alternative explanation for OCD is the diathesis stress model. What this model does is propose an explanation for how biological and environmental factors may be interconnected. It suggests that genetics may be involved, that they create a predisposition or vulnerability for OCD. In other words, some people may have the specific genes which makes it more likely that they develop OCD. But OCD may never develop unless there is an environmental trigger, a stressor. The diathesis stress model suggests that environmental factors can trigger or increase the risk of developing OCD. Some research suggests that OCD may be more common in people who have been bullied, abused or neglected and it sometimes starts after an important life event such as childbirth or a bereavement. Cromer et al in 2007 found that over 50% of the OCD patients in their sample had a traumatic event in their past. Therefore, this suggests that the biological explanation alone is not sufficient to fully explain OCD and that the diathesis stress model helpfully offers an explanation for how biology and the environment may be both involved. Finally, one great way to discuss the biological explanation relates to the debates you learn about in psychology. The biological explanation for OCD has been criticised for being deterministic. This is because it states that OCD is determined or caused by internal biological factors such as genetics or neural factors. As a result, people who are suffering with OCD have no control over their behaviour, they have no free will and are unable to change. This is a rather pessimistic view of the condition as it implies that they cannot improve and that their obsessive thoughts and compulsive behaviours are inevitable. Perhaps it could be argued that taking a deterministic view could actually further add to the anxiety that those suffering with OCD already experience. Therefore, this suggests that the biological explanation is rather limited in its view of OCD because of the lack of choice it sees people have to manage it. If you like this video and want to be a top psychologist, consider giving me some positive reinforcement with that like button and perhaps leave a comment below. For more on the topic of psychopathology and mental disorders, check out this playlist for more. And if you would like more information relating to mental health, whether to help you or others, do check out the links in the description for some helpful online resources and support services. I hope you found this video helpful and we'll see you in the next one.